This is Wrestling's Greatest Moments. Hey now, it's time for another episode of Wrestling's Greatest Moments. Every fan has their favorite era of wrestling, but what about a particular year? Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments makes a case why 1983 was the greatest year to be a wrestling fan. The second golden age of tag team wrestling. Now, if you love tag team wrestling, this was your year, as tag team wrestling enjoyed what wrestling historians eventually labeled as the second golden age of tag team wrestling. The first taking place during the 1950s. Tag team wrestling was always popular. Indeed, Jim Crockett Promotions' focus was on tag team wrestling, but it never seemed bigger than it did in the 1980s. The success of the Fabulous Ones, who debuted in 1982, and the Road Warriors, who debuted in 1983, spawned a slew of imitators. Some forgettable, but others who carved out their own legacy, including the Rock and Roll Express, the Fantastics, the Powers of Pain, and Demolition. Oh, what a rush. Green as grass, Hawk and Animal nevertheless won fans over through the wrestling equivalent of Smash Mouth Football. The team's leather outfits and face paint made them stand out from the pack, but it was their superhuman physiques that commanded the fans' attention. From there, fans never had a chance to catch their breath, as the roadies destroyed everyone who stepped in their path. Georgia Championship Wrestling promoter Ole Anderson's wise decision to book the Road Warriors in short explosive matches got them over instantly, and before the end of the year, they were the hottest act in tag team wrestling and perhaps all of wrestling. The Dynamite Kid vs. Tiger Mask while North American fans were enjoying a variety of fantastic matches and storylines, Japanese fans were watching one of wrestling's most epic matchups, the Dynamite Kid vs. Tiger Mask. Both wrestlers were at the height of their careers and dazzled fans with their flawless performances, creating matches that became classics. Although the 1980s was often a big man's game, particularly in the WWF, the work of Dynamite, Tiger Mask, and similar wrestlers would popularize the faster-paced style in tag team wrestling. Hulk Hogan Ichiban 1983 was a banner year for Hulk Hogan, as he crushed it in the American Wrestling Association and in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Hulkamania was running wild in the AWA, although it would take the creative genius of Vince McMahon to utilize it to its full potential, while Hogan had proven himself to be a sensation in Japan. Fans familiar with Hogan's work in Japan know that his style was much more elaborate than what fans saw in the United States, a recognition that Hogan knew what worked and where. In fact, Hogan's presence at the prestigious and technically driven St. Louis territory should cast any doubts as to his ability to work. The Hulkster was in such demand that he even worked in championship wrestling from Florida and Mexico's Universal Wrestling Association. As popular as Hogan was in 1983, things were only getting started. Wrestling Evolves 1983 saw promoters, wrestlers, and outsiders willing to test wrestling's boundaries. The industry had always sought to find new ways to expand, but 1983 saw several successes that led to seismic changes in the business over the next few years. Cable TV expands fan access to wrestling. Cable television was around long before 1983, but by 1983, it was becoming apparent that the days of promotions only airing shows out of a certain locale were over. For example, Georgia Championship Wrestling aired on Ted Turner's Superstation TBS for years, providing fans with cable access the chance to enjoy that promotion and whichever promotion was in their hometown, be it the AWA, the WWF, or the NWA. In 1983, the WWF purchased TV time on the USA Network, gaining a foothold in the national market. While this was bad news for the territory's monopoly, it was a major win for fans with cable access who were able to watch wrestling from around the country. Starcade. Much can be said about Jim Crockett Promotions' closed circuit event, Starcade. So much that we've devoted an entire video to it. JCP's attempt to expand the audience of a show beyond that of one arena proved successful. So successful that it became an annual event it also proved to Vince McMahon that the wrestling world was ready for closed circuit, which led him to promoting his own closed circuit event, WrestleMania. Twists and Turns 1983 featured many iconic feuds, with the following just being a sampling of the smorgasbord of SmackDowns delivered throughout territories in 1983. Jimmy Snuka vs. Don Morocco Jimmy Superfly Snuka's babyface turn led to an explosive feud with the magnificent Morocco. 
A battle that culminated in another steel cage match for fans to witness Snuka diving from the top of the cage. Snuka needed no title, so the WWF concocted a wonky finish where Morocco was knocked through the cage door, inadvertently retaining the title. While Snuka's personal demons slowed him down, he was the WWF's most popular performer until the arrival of Hulk Hogan and Sergeant Slaughter's 1984 babyface turn. The Dirty Yellow Dog Like many territories, championship wrestling from Florida was cooking on all burners. Just when things cooled down with the Midnight Riders' departure, the promotion saw Ron Bass betray Dusty Rhodes during the American Dream's NWA title match against Harley Race, leading to Bass becoming to one of the area's top villains. Quite the feat in light of Kevin Sullivan's many dirty deeds. As detailed in our video, more masked wrestlers who weren't fooling anyone, Bass humiliated Barry Windham in a post-match attack where he placed a saddle on Barry's back, riding him around the ring. Windham disappeared from Florida, with manager J.J. Dillon comparing him to a dirty yellow dog. Not a bright move, as a masked man in a canary yellow outfit calling himself the yellow dog showed up, making life miserable for Bass. The man they hated for years. Buddy Rose's face turn in Don Owen's Pacific Northwest epitomized the wrestling rule that the greater the fans loathing, the greater their love when a heel turns babyface. In 1983, Playboy Buddy Rose, the heel equivalent of Dusty Rhodes in that he looked like no paragon of physical fitness, but could work 60 minute matches and talk fans into the building, turned babyface after years as the promotion's top villain. Rose had done many unthinkable things during his career in Portland, but nothing as shocking as when he saved babyfaces Billy Jack Haynes and Kurt Henning, two men he previously tormented in the promotion, from heels Rip Oliver, the Dynamite Kid, and the Assassin. Rose's face turn was over by the end of 1984, but the turn was a thing of beauty. The Last Battle of Atlanta Wildfire Tommy Rich's epic two-year feud against Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer culminated in the historic steel cage match billed as the last Battle of Atlanta. While it's just difficult to pin down when a bout took place for the first time, just ask any wrestling historian when the first tag team match took place, and you'll need a cage to have them argue things out. Many historians cite this as the first cage match with a top to it. This prevented Sawyer from climbing over the cage, a necessity given Mad Dog's habit of taking a powder when things went south for him. While some fans criticized the feud for running too long, two years, the cage match was won for the ages. Incredibly, footage of the historic match was believed to have been lost to the ages, as it was believed the video had been erased or thrown out. Thankfully, the footage was discovered decades later and can be seen on the WWE Network. The Final Conflict As detailed in the book, the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, the tag teams, Don Kernodal and Sergeant Slaughter decided it was time to make some money by working a program with Jim Crockett Promotions' top babyface team, Jay Youngblood and Ricky Steamboat. The two heels wrote up a storyline in a notebook during their road trips from one town to another. The result was a dramatic and violent series between the two teams that captivated fans in the mid-Atlantic area. After many twists and turns, the feud culminated in a steel cage match billed as the final conflict. This would be Steamboat and Youngblood's last chance to win the titles, and if they lost, they could never wrestle again. The match proved so popular that thousands of fans were reportedly turned away at the box office and traffic grinding to a halt. The wrestlers involved battled the traffic to make it to the show, but they arrived, with the babyfaces winning the belts. The final conflict success played a large role in Jim Crockett Promotions' decision to gamble on airing Starcade on closed circuit television. Memphis Madness. The Memphis-based Continental Wrestling Association continued to provide some of the wildest matches and storylines in all of wrestling. Promoters Jerry Jarrett and Jerry the King Lawler's formula of action-packed matches and feuds fueled by increasingly complex stipulation bouts kept fans coming back every week. Hometown hero Jerry Lawler's dance card was full in 1983 as he challenged Nick Bockwinkle for the AWA World Championship traded the Southern title with Memphis's Rogues Gallery and continued his feud with the Hollywood star Andy Kaufman. The wildly popular tag team, the Fabulous Ones, had fierce feuds against the Sheep Herders, the Moondogs, and the Assassins, while the Rock and Roll Express went from a team designed to supplement the Fabs on B-shows to becoming a top-notch act in their own right. Von Erichs vs. Freebirds Feud As we've seen, 
1983 featured an array of hot feuds, but none as epic as the fabulous Freebirds' war with the Von Erichs. Although the feud began on Christmas night, 1982, when Freebird Michael Hayes turned heel during Kerry Von Erich's steel cage match against Ric Flair. The feud raged through 1983, with both sides winning battles, but neither side winning the war. The Freebirds Von Erich feud was a license to print money for world-class championship wrestling, as seen by the sensational crowds for stadium shows that year. The Iron Sheik captures the WWF Championship. The wrestling world was shocked when the Iron Sheik captured the WWF Championship from longtime champion Bob Backlund. However, this unthinkable defeat was just the beginning of Vince McMahon's plan to take the WWF to new heights. And just a month later, Hulk Hogan defeated the Iron Sheik for the title, beginning the WWF's road to national dominance in the 80s. My Breakfast with Blassie. No mention of 1983's greatest would be complete without mentioning My Breakfast with Blassie. Andy Kaufman's love for performance art made a run in professional wrestling a must. And while his feud against Jerry the King Lawler was cooling off, Kaufman's involvement with the sport of kings was far from over. In 1983, he co-starred in My Breakfast with Blassie, a hilarious send-up of the 1981 art film. For those wondering, Andre the Giant was not involved with either film. Writers Johnny Legend and Linda Lautrec crafted a surreal script that has to be seen to be believed. The film was set at a Sambo's restaurant and featured Kaufman and Blassie exchanging various insights into life. The film is a must-see. Whether you're a fan of Andy's unique humor or the inner workings of classy Freddie Blassie, we've made our case, or have we? Let us know what year you think was the greatest year to be a wrestling fan. Share your thoughts in the comments section and let us know if there are any videos you'd like wrestling's greatest moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and spread the good news about wrestling's greatest moments, the channel that celebrates the squared circle.